back on the Balcanio, and I'm going to present you LSTM original autoencoders for network signal anomaly detection. This is not my first time in the PyConf. It's the second time. Last year I spoke about deep learning as well, but not about sequence, but about image detection. I presented a project that using a network called Mask RCNN, detected the lanes in the roads, watching them from inside the car, from inside the cockpit of the car. But this year, I switched a little bit in my career and I'm working with uh, signals and sequences. I'm working nowadays in a company called, called Tesla. Tesla, uh, it's an English company bought by Altran a couple of years ago. Altran is a very big French company that has been moving the French market for more than 30 years. And we are all data scientists. I work in Paris now. We have a, a team of 15 people. There is a team in Toulouse, about 20 people, and a team in Lyon. We are 35 now. We are the world-class center for analytics of, of Altran. And we deliver projects in data science, artificial intelligence, signal detections, image detection, video, text, everything related to analytics. We usually partner with clients that want to develop this kind of techniques, and we go there or we do it in our house for a couple of months and we deliver projects. Why are we different from the rest? We are data science consultants and we specifically do that. Well, our idea is to develop models as best as we can and deliver efficiency and proficiency as special as we can do. In the world, we are more than 200 people. There's a team in the US, there's a the big team is in the UK with more than 150 data scientists. There's a team in the Netherlands, there's another team in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy. Well, we are big now, we are growing. So if you're interested in data science, interested in machine learning or interested in continue, you should contact us because we are looking for people. We are 35 in, in France and we're going to grow to 70 to, to next year, so don't hesitate in contact us. Today, I'm going to speak about unsupervised learning. What to do when our data, when our data is not labeled. It's a problem that happens a lot in machine learning. So for you, if I tell you to distinguish between cats and dogs in this picture, it's kind of easy, no? It's not that complicated. But if you're a machine, that might not be the case. So you will have to try to understand which are the things that distinguish cats from dogs, if the ears or the mouth, or, or if they are big or they are not big. So unsupervised learning is to find unknown patterns without pre-existing labels. Clear's example is to make a cluster analysis and to try to detect different groups on data that we have no labels. It could be clients, it could be whatever you like. Or a more sophisticated example, what I'm going to show you later, is a density estimation in your data. I'm trying to intend an a priori probability distribution. What I'm going to show you with variational autoencoders later. Another important concept before we start with the show is what's anomaly detection? Anomaly, anomaly detection is the idea of you have a data set and a little part of your data, it's really bizarre and you cannot explain it but it's different from the rest. But it has to be a little part. If not, it's not an anomaly. Imagine if you have 80% of your data that is strange, then it's not an anomaly. Then you, are, you need to understand your data in another way. So if you see this nice picture, you can detect an anomaly really easily. But what if I tell you there are more anomalies and you have to look deeply into each puzzle to try to understand them? Well, that's the idea of anomaly detection. Trying to look into the data and discover these little percentages that are clearly difficult for us 
but for machines could be kind of simpler. A definition could be the identification of rare events or observations that would raise suspicions by being different from, different from the larger part of the data. Common cases, bank fraud, medical problems, trying to detect cancer in, in an image, trying to detect an abnormal cerebral activity, like if they are being hackers or if they're just having a problem in a server, that kind of things that happen maybe randomly, maybe once a month, maybe once a year. But if you don't detect it, it could be really, really expensive for a company. Classical methods for, to solve this problem, SVMs, support vector machines, HMMs, the Markov chains, cluster analysis, Bayesian networks, and what I'm going to explain to you, autoencoders. But before that, I want to speak a little bit about deep learning, what's all the bats we are hearing about. We've been to the keynote a couple of minutes ago that they don't spoke very well about deep learning and what you can do with it. I don't have the same opinion. I think that in the right hands it could be good, but of course there's all this fear of, this, of the governments trying to, to push into doing things the wrong way. Nevertheless, it's in our, in our hands to do things differently. So, what is deep learning? Deep learning is encapsulated into machine learning and encapsulated into artificial intelligence. The idea of artificial intelligence is not that a machine will be like a human. The, that's the idea of a general artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is enable machines to do a specific task like a human would do, but a specific one, not all of it. There goes machine learning, is to try to train machines to get better at that task without explicitly telling it to go left or to go right. He will try to do it by itself using optimization techniques, using different types. And they are where deep learning lies. It's using a specific technique, a multi-layer network, to train this type of machine learning algorithms. Another definition that it will be maybe important is that it's a connection of algorithms of algorithms used in machine learning, used to model high-level abstractions in data through the use of modern architectures. It's part of a broad family of methods, and the idea is to use and represent data in a different way. There are a couple of things that are really important nowadays and to understand the path of deep learning for the last 15 years, I would say. The amount of data that we have in the servers are, are increasing exponentially. We never saw this growth in data before. And we are using it. It's free to use. There are a lot of open data sets. They are labeled. So a lot of models could be built with that. This is one of the explanations of the past. Another explanation is that the optimization algorithms to reduce the loss of these models are getting better and better. Gradient descent has been increased and improved like 10 times using stochastic gradient descent, RSM prop, or Adam, or L Adam, a couple of times. That makes our network train faster and gets to better results. We have more filters now. Before we only had the fully convolutional filters. Now we have convolutional filters, LSTMs, GRUs, dropout, patch norm, several others that go for different tasks. You don't use a fully convolutional to, to export a probability, you use a softmax. So the idea is that you choose different filters to try to do different things inside the network. That's the idea of deep learning. Choosing which layer will go in, this, in the good place to get you the result you need. Other, another very important topic is the computer capabilities that have been improved for, for the years. GPUs, TPUs, and now the super cool TPU bus that Google launched a couple of months ago. You can do uh, in 2015, took you like one week in one hour. It's amazing. 
It's expensive as well, but it's amazing. And last but not least is this Marvel DC war between Google and Facebook about their, which is the best framework in deep learning, who is going to win the war. I started using Keras because it was easy. Then I passed to PyTorch because it was easier. And then I knew what the client needs. And nowadays, this project was done in TensorWorld. But the idea is that this, this challenge between these two companies is super great for the, for the environment. They are pushing our developers to do things in a better way, in a more clever way, trying to reduce the code, trying to make better networks. And I really like this little war that's happening between PyTorch and TensorFlow that has just released their 2.0 version that is amazing. But well, we'll leave that for another talk. Let's go into recursive neural networks, some applicable AI. The idea is that we have a network with loops. We usually use RNNs when we, we work with sequences. We have a sequence of data, and we try to predict, okay, something that is also a sequence. So the idea is that we can persist information in time. Sorry. A recurrent neural network can be thought of multiple cases of the same neural network that passes information to the next copy of itself. So in this case, you could persist information on something that he learned like 10 steps ago, now you need it, now he goes out with it. The problem with that is that the way that this RNN works, it's really difficult to keep things from the past. How it works, it's pretty simple. The two inputs get concatenated together and they pass through a signal. So things that were 10, 20 steps ago get little by little every time and the importance you give to things that happen a long time ago get diminished every time. So it's a very big problem in Ireland. Well, that's what I want to talk about. This is the gap between the relevant information and when you need that relevant information. It's really hard for RNNs to solve this issue. Theoretically, in the first paper of RNN, they, they could have done it, but in practice it doesn't work. Horeca and Bencho have some papers about why they don't work. If you are entering deep learning, those two guys are one of the fathers of deep learning, so you should read a lot of them. Nevertheless, that's when LSTM networks come. They arrive to solve this issue, to solve the long-term dependency problem. It came out in 1997 in a paper from Schrodinger and Schrodinger, two German guys, also very important people in the deep learning world. And the idea was to try to solve this, this issue, to solve the long-term dependency problem. And how did they manage to do this? They replaced the single concatenation and sigmoid process inside the RNN with a more complex process. The most important thing of the LSTM is the belt you can see in the up part of the image. This belt connects, connects all the inputs and decides what to get in or what to get out. It's the most important thing and it's the key of LSTM. And that belt has the ability to remove or add information to a set state. That's how it's called this belt, the set state. And it carefully regulates structures called the gates. Gates that input or output information. So when you think about a human that can think and can remember things, what's the idea of remembering things and switching between important and not important? An important fact is not remembering. The important fact is being able to forget. Because if you could remember everything that happened in the last day, it would be a fucking complicated thing in your life. 
Imagine remembering everything. It's not possible. You should remember the important stuff, like, I don't know, the birthday of your mother. You should remember that, not when she was to, to sleep. So the important thing is to forget, to forget the things that are not important. And that's what LSTM does. Forgetting things and works really good. Let's go to the gates. The first one and more important is the forget gate. The first gate the, of our LSTM decides what information we are going to throw away from the previous states. And repeating what I said before, LSTM excels in knowing which information to save for the future, which will be relevant and when to forget it. Because maybe it was relevant just like till yesterday. But now I don't need any more. Uh, my mother's birthday was yesterday, I don't need to remember until next year. So I can forget it now. That's the idea. And this gate has this function. Then you have the input gate. The input gate is used to decide which information we're going to store in each cell state. Let me go back, I forgot a little stuff. You see the W and the Bs on the data equations, that are the weights that we are going to train the network. Those weights are initiated, are initiated in a random way, but moving forward in training, they get changed. And that's the idea of learning, trying to get to the good weights of our network. Same thing happens here. We change, we have four weights instead of only two, because you can see you have two paths, some more complex gate. And last, but not least, is the output layer gate. Here, we need to decide what to output and what to give to the next state of our model. So we need to filter things that are, are going to be important and filter things that are not going to be important and forget them. That's the idea. And moving forward, we are going to get into autoencoders. How can we learn data? Representations using deep learning. I don't know how many of you are aware of PCAs, principal component analysis or multiple component analysis. The idea of trying to reduce the dimensions of our data. Well, autoencoders works that way, but in a deep learning way. We have our data, and the idea is to make a reconstruction of our data using this model. We will have a decoder, we will have a decoder, and we have a compressed layer. This compressed layer will try to compress information as much as possible. They are called latent variables. By making the network learn how to reproduce the input, it forces the compressor layer to learn a compressed representation of the input. So the idea is that we're going to train the network with a lot of images, in this case, it could be any data that you like, and we will try to output the same information. So this network will be a generator of data. Then we move a little bit the, the compressed layers without using the encoder. Imagine that the network is well trained, and we will generate new images. So you might think, okay, you have a generator of images, you have a layer that has your data compressed, but how does that work for anomaly detection? I don't see the connection. Well, we will get to that later. One more thing is the variation of the color. It's the idea of imposing a probability distribution into that latent space. Instead of having some normal matrix inside of that latent variable, we'll have a mean and a variance. And the idea is that with those two variables, we have a random space. And we can randomly select a, a number, or a couple of numbers, or whatever you like, to give them into the decoder. But what's different about this is that we push our probability distribution into that network. We pushed a normal distribution inside. We need the encoder to exit a normal distribution. And how we do that? Using the KLD divergence. 
I don't want to get into the mathematics of this, but the idea is that you have a normal distribution of mi1 and stochastic variance, stochastic of variance zero, and we push our probably our distribution into this normal one. We try to reduce us the maximum using the scale diversions. That is a measure on how different are two probabilities. So in the loss function, we will have to add this. So the idea is that if we can manage to have a probability distribution that would have good values in our universe, in the case that an image that has not been part of the training and is very different from the training gets into our network, this mean would be very high. And that's the idea that we want to, 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 to see here. If the mean is high, we can say, as a hypothesis, that we have an anomaly. That this image is not what we expect. That this signal is not what we expect. And we can work with that. Well, that's the idea of a micro model. For some model, the name can be funny, but when I arrive to this client where I'm working, it's a very big tele telecommunication company in Paris. They were working with a model made by an, a Chinese company. Uh, the Chinese company is Alibaba. And the model was called Donut. It was really American, we didn't like it, so we generated a, a new version of it. Completely different, changing the layers, changing the way we optimize it, and we call it Prasam. It's a bi directional LSTM, variational encoder. All this introduction I made, sorry if it's been a little bit long, is to show you this model. It's a variational encoder, as you can see, but it uses bi directional LSTM layers. What's the difference between LSTM and bi directional LSTM? The idea is that instead of having only one input, the sequence, you have the same sequence as the first input, but the, se the second input is the same sequence but reversed. So you have two inputs and you have two outputs as well. You need to average it in order to put it into the next layer. As researchers say and researchers show, the usage of bidirectional LSTM is to attend 15% boost in your models. So for us, it was, was really good. And we saw the boost in our model as well. We did a lot of training with directional and bidirectional, and also multiple LSTM layers, one after the other one. And also using, as you say, skip connections. They didn't work that well, so we kept this kind of basic and really nice Croissant model. So the idea, we have the mean and the sigma. We will make a sample about, from that, and then we will reconstruct the sequence data. Which is our data? Our data is data from routers. We have more than 100,000 routers that send information to each other. And we need to detect where are the anomalies. What is happening? Why this peak is happening this time, and why not another time? And that will be sent to the network cockpit of the company. And in case the anomaly is strange, it would it would attack it on time. So, as I said before, the latent variable mean is the one we use to detect anomalies. We use a k-mean per signal to be able to detect which is the threshold that, will, that we will say that it's an anomaly. After that value, we will say that it's an anomaly. Here, we have a lot of work to do, and I'm open to, to suggestions as well, uh, because imagine you have a signal that today is rumbling from one megabyte to 100 megabytes, and tomorrow someone opens Netflix and it goes to one giga. Our threshold for today was 150 megas. But that threshold is not going to work for tomorrow. So it's a big problem. We have to update the models every day. It's not the best solution. 
Uh, we are working on a, a better solution that is more clever. We didn't get that yet, but we are working on it. Nowadays, it's working. We update the model every day, and it has a, a good response. Let's go a little to the code. I don't know if you are familiarized with TensorFlow and Keras. I'm using QNN LSTM layers. They are much more faster than normal LSTM layers. They are optimized to be used in NVIDIA GPUs. Well, for this uh, project, we the company bought a, an NVIDIA really expensive server, so we have four GPUs of 30 gigas each. So we needed to optimize it as much as possible. And TensorFlow was needed in order to be able to use multi-GPUs. This is the model parameters, the batch size, how, how many signals are we, making, are we entering into the model. The idea is that we can work with only one sequence, like the amount of bits that enter into the router, but as well we could be working on the amount of conflicts that the router has as well, we would be working on the amount of uh, lost package that the router has. A lot of information is, is being outputted by the routers that we are not using. That's something that we are also thinking of using. We have the learning rate of the model, the number of GPUs that we are going to use, and well, the architecture of the model that can change any time. To be trained again, you cannot change the architecture in the middle of the, of the training. Do you happen to see? Well, the idea, this is the model, this is the encoded. We have a B direction, a QNN LSTM inside. Then you have some dense models that are the latent variables. Then you have the sample modeling that outputs two values from the distribution we have before. And then we have the decoder that is exactly the same as the encoder, that's the idea. Work with a mirror distribution. And we generate three models, not only one. We generate a model, a complete model, that reconstructs the image. You have an input and an output. The idea is to be the same. Then you have a second model that will be the encoder. It will output the mean and the variance. Then we have a third model that will, from this mean and this variance, will output the reconstructed cycle. So in the end we have three models. To train, we use the first one. We need the full cycle. But you know, in inference time, we don't need the, the, the coder. We only need the encoder, because we are going to check if the mean of the input is high or not. If it goes up of the threshold or it doesn't go up. That's the idea. This is the loss function, as I told you before. It's a mixture between this KL diversion loss and a mean square error, a simple one, that gets the difference between the, the input and the output. And as well, trying to fix this distribution into the latent variables. To train it, we use a recent prop, the learning rate, and we have another, a couple of other TensorBoard callbacks to use. TensorBoard to, well, to decrease the learning rate, to export another variables that are important to make, to see which is the reconstruction of the, of the sign up in the middle of the training, to see like, if it's getting better or not. We have another self-made TensorBoard callback that shows in terms of all this image through Epoch, so you can see the, how it varies from the Epoch 1 to Epoch 100, how it gets better. And this is the multi-GPU training. This took a lot of time. Let me go back a little bit here. You see the second line when I include GPU 0? That means that the most important part of the model, the original values of the weights, will be always stored in the first GPU. What's the problem? 
When we work with multi GPUs environment, and you use things from like normal, you don't do anything to touch this. Weights are normally stored in the CPU and then get copied into the GPU every time you make an update. So if you want to speed up your process, that doesn't work at all because you want to make the GPU work faster and make apples faster, but you are getting a latency, a very big latency between the GPU and the CPU every time you make an update. So we solve this issue putting the model in the GPU, in the first one. And then copying inside the GPU takes much less time. The latency is, is almost something that we can not think about. Nevertheless, we have to reduce the batch size. It's a part of the model that is stored there, so we cannot reuse it to, to try. Let's go to see some, uh, well, one thing before, to, to create a model, it's simply some, as simple as that. You call the class, you put your parameters, you generate the model, and you call the feed generator when you have your sequences, how many epochs you are going to use, which are the workers, <coughs> if you have a queue size, if you're using multiple processes, there are a lot of multi-parameters that you use, but it's not as important as having a good model. Having a good model is one of the keys of, of deep learning. And then for inference, it's pretty similar. You create the model and you load the weights that you trained before. And then with new data, you try to inference data that nowadays we use a Kafka server that will ingest data into a TensorFlow Docker in order to output data in a real life way, in a real time way. Some results. First of all, I, this is a reconstruction. We are not looking for anomalies now in this picture. You can see that it detects pretty well when it's going up and it's going down. But when you have a peak, it's not, it's not detecting the peak. So there, there should be an anomaly because he's not really understanding that the data, he cannot reconstruct it, so we can suspect that there will be a, an anomaly. Same thing happens here, but the anomaly is detected. He understands what the problem is. You have a threshold for the color that in the peaks on the right are not being detected, but in the left they have a big peak. You can say that it's an anomaly. Here is a more strange picture. There are a couple of anomalies detected, but not, not all of them. Here I must, might suspect that the threshold is not as good as we thought. So we have to move forward into a better producing threshold. I don't know if you can see the green lights that are oh, it's not as good as I thought. But the idea is that you have an encoder that gets out. Oh, I can do nothing about it. Well, the, and the, in the right, in the axis of the right, you have the encoder, and in the axis of the left, you have the input data. So when the axis of the left goes more than, as you can see here, 300 or 30 micro, microseconds, I, I would expect, I don't know the unit. Okay, it would say that it's an anomaly. <clears throat> Same thing happens here. It doesn't detect the first one. He says, ah, oh, okay, it's only one, maybe, it's not an anomaly. It's pretty clear of the model to understand when things are going repetitive. To say, okay, there is an anomaly, and there is a certain time that says, okay, that's not more anomaly, it's being normal. That's the idea. That he can understand and learn from himself. Last but not least, a really classical image that has things going for from 5 to 10 megas and a couple of peaks that are detected as anomalies.
And I would love to end with a phrase from Andrew N.G. He's one of the fathers of deep learning, as I say. He has really good courses in Coursera. He worked in Baidu. And he said that deep learning will transform everyday industry, healthcare, and transportation will be transformed by deep learning. I want to live in an AI powered society. That's what Andrew N.J. said. I want as well. So, thank you very much for coming, and I hope you like the presentation. If you have any questions, if you have any questions, you can answer them in French. Yes, please. Can you remove the slides or not? Okay. Euh, encore une des premières ou n'importe laquelle ouais celle-là par exemple ça ouais euh, pourquoi il y a un décalage entre enfin euh, un décalage on va dire en avance entre la prédiction et la data en input ouais apparemment et il y a un décalage de trois time steps mais il doit être là-bas dans tu vois la, la ligne bleue c'est ça parce que l'anomalie s'est détectée normalement deux ou trois fois plus tard que dans la réalité. Donc, il détecte l'anomalie, mais pas exactement où est, sinon. Pardon, je vais le Ah, attends. Excuse-moi. Je disais que l'anomalie. C'est détecté par fenêtre. Ok Donc il y a une fenêtre des 30 valeurs qui entrent à le modèle. Il entre, mais c'est les premières ou les deuxièmes valeurs. Normalement, il n'est pas détecté. Il est détecté dans les troisième ou quatrième valeurs qui entrent. Donc, normalement, c'est décalé dans les, dans les points. Donc, c'est normal ça dans notre modèle, mais peut-être dans la démonstration, il faudra. Réajuster ça. Ouais, je, je suis d'accord avec toi. Oui. Des autres questions Ok, merci.